morning, everybody. So morning. once again, we, <laughs> good morning. Uh, in fact, okay, if you're out in Zoom, go ahead and unmute so everybody can hear you here in the sanctuary. Say hello. Hi. 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 Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Right. Lots of love. <laughs> and being the kind of church we are, like at the last minute kind of church, we may have a few more people arriving either in person or by Zoom. So this is a hybrid service. So many, many people are attending on the computer as opposed to in person, but we are very happy to have you this morning. And we begin by centering ourselves after we make any announcements for the life of the church. So I just want to run through, sorry, I hear an echo. Okay, um, we have a four o'clock memorial service today for Judy Herrick, who was our former organist. So uh, oh, yeah. if you haven't gotten in touch with Cindy, who's coordinating that, you are more than welcome to do so by email or let me know in person, please, that you're coming because we're, we have to do a seating chart to permit everybody to be here. Or you can watch on Zoom or you can watch on Facebook Live. Zoom. Yeah, and I'm going to ask everybody to mute now, except me. If you mute me, then you won't hear anything. Yeah, there we go. So um, we're also going to do a pet blessing next Sunday at 9 o'clock at the gazebo. So we're going to do it two weeks in a row. We did it today. We're going to do it again next week just to make sure everybody has a chance to bring their beloved creatures down for a good blessing with our youth. And those are the only announcements that I have for the life of the church this week. Is there anything that I forgot to mention that somebody else wants to say anything about? Jeanette, go ahead. Everyone may have received a letter this week from the church council as a reminder to continue your contributions for 2020 and also consider prayerfully what you might be willing to contribute for 2021. When the process of putting together the budget, and it, it's extremely helpful to know what people's intentions are. There's a pledge card included with the envelope. If you would return that in the envelope provided, that would be helpful along with any contributions that you feel you wish to make. I would also like to draw your attention to some notes in the newsletter that came out electronically this week. October is the month that we're um, suggesting contributions for the conference funds. And those are explained in the newsletter. And if you have a desire to contribute to any of those funds, you could also include that check with your return of pledge and pledge um, card. So lots of things going on in hopefully one envelope for you to make it easier. If you do want to support any of the conference funds, please designate how much for each fund. Um, and that would be helpful as we try to sh um, pass that money on to the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Any other announcements for the life of the church or the community? Anybody out here have something that they want to share? <laughs> okay. Um, and it is pumpkin people season, and we do have a pumpkin person exhibit outside. We have uh, Noah's Ark with lots of pumpkins, and we've been inviting children to take pumpkins away and paint them as animals and bring them back. So our, our Ark contingent has been growing slowly over the last week or two. So very fun to have an interactive way of contributing to the to the community life okay now we've we've done all of our logistical businessy type things and so i'm going to ask that everyone center yourselves and just arrive in in your area where you're sitting down and focusing and being here with us 
and Alan will play some centering music for us. We are going to open with a reading from St. Francis because it is the month of St. Francis and we're doing pet blessings in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. So we'll begin with a reading of the Canticle of the Creatures. Most high, all powerful, good Lord, yours is the praise, the glory, and the honor and every blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong and no one is worthy to speak your name. Praised be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun, who is the day through whom you bring us light, and he is lovely, shining with great splendor. For he heralds you, Most High. Praised be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and stars. In heaven you have formed them, lightsome and precious and fair. And praised be you, my Lord, through brother wind, through air and cloud, through calm, and every weather by which you sustain your creatures. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister water, so very useful and humble, precious and chaste. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother fire, by whom you light up the night, and he is handsome and merry, robust and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through your sis our sister Mother Earth, who sustains us and directs us, bringing forth all kinds of fruits and colored flowers and herbs. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who forgive for your love and who bear sickness and trial. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, they will be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no living being can escape. How blessed are those she finds in your most holy will, for the second death can do them no harm. O oh, praise and bless my Lord, thank him and serve him humbly, but grandly. So the 8 o'clock had an interesting chat. We, we get together sometimes, some of us outside at the 8 o'clock at the pavilion, and we chatted a bit about St. Francis and his influences. He sounded very animistic, kind of Celtic or nature-based, um, almost a blessing that you would hear in a Native American context or other kind of context. So it was interesting that he used language to make nature into the siblings um, and to make us equal on equal footing with other animals and other beings and other created elements that are part of God's holy environment. And it was, a, it was an intriguing thought to explore. And that brings us to prayer this morning. We begin with prayers of the people. So we ask for any prayer concerns and then we'll move to celebrations. And so at this time, if we have any um, specific prayers that people want to lift up, and I will begin with a reminder that a beloved member of our community, Phil Gravink, died in hospice this week. Um, and we will await 
news from the family about how they are going to choose to mark his life and remember him. But again, today we are remembering another member of our community, Judy Herrick. And we will have some beautiful, beautiful music that will be shared here today because of her wonderful role as a musician here in this valley. And so gratitude for the lives of people who shaped our world. Phil Gravink was so instrumental in shaping the world of the skiing community here. He, he helped found and create some of our downhill skiing culture. Um, so he leaves a big footprint in the world. Other prayers of concern that anyone might wish to lift up? Barbie. Okay, so you want to speak for Jean, okay. 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 Okay, so Jean's whole family. So Jean, who's often with us, is not feeling well, and she has people visiting from out of state, and now it seems like the whole family's not feeling too good. So we're going to uphold the family in prayer, um, and we'll just wait it out with them and pray for their wellness and their recovery and their healing. Thank you, Barbara. Any other prayers here in the sanctuary, Alan? Okay. So prayers for Father Steve from Our Lady of the Mountains, who's, as we know, um, away taking care of his parents. And so his um, community misses him. They are supporting him being where he needs to be. But, you know, it's a challenging time to be without your minister, your priest. And for his parents and his whole family. And then for uh, one of our cantors at the um, Our Lady of the Mountains who will be undergoing surgery. And surgery is a good topic. We have many, many people who will be undergoing different kinds of surgery. So for those that are undergoing procedures in the next few weeks um let us let us hold our bodies which are so very mortal as saint francis said right our sister Padalita, like our mortality is with us always and so prayers for our fragile and resilient bodies um, that wherever healing is possible whether it is something that's operable like a, a joint replacement or a heart or a you know, spinal, some type of procedure that can correct something or whether people are undergoing other kinds of treatment for things like cancer. And we have many, many people that are experiencing that. Some of them are able to share their journey and others are very private about it. And we think two of those that are living with mental health conditions. We have people that do really well most of the time in their lives, but sometimes a mental health diagnosis can also get the best of you. And so for resilience and stability and just a sense of peace and a life without pain, mental pain and emotional pain um, in these times. Please, if you are in Zoom and you have a prayer request, Please go ahead and unmute yourself and share it because I may not catch any raised hands. I'm scanning, but I don't see anybody off the top of my head here. All right, you guys are going to be quiet. Then I'm going to move us to celebrations because we need good news in these days as well. Um, we give thanks for the sunlight. We give thanks for the beauty of this weekend 
and this season, uh, the numbers of people that come and share the beauty of this place with us, the blessings that the earth gives us, the reminders of what is larger than ourselves to which we can be connected. And, you know, the face of God, we see the face of God in each other, but we see it too in the changing of the season and the way the sky the sky looks and the way the sun comes through the leaves and simply the way the world is showing its splendor and its resilience to us. We give thanks. And we give thanks for this community, for this little church and this little village that does the work of, with other churches, upholding our larger valley we respond to a lot of things that are invisible to people. We're cute and we're pretty, but we work with the homeless and we feed people and we take care of our neighbors and we give rides to doctors and we visit people in prison and in hospitals and at the end of their lives, we are present to each other and we reach beyond this valley to other parts of the world. We think of Honduras, we think of Zimbabwe, we think of the areas that have been hit just last night by hurricanes that are living still with fires. People from our community are helping fight those fires. And so we think of the ways that we are connected. And though we may feel small by ourselves, we are not small because we are not alone. We do these things. We are of service and of love to each other in connection and in community. I ask you now to join me in prayer. Holy God, we have named people and places. And this morning at 8 o'clock, the words that people lifted up were peace and healing. That in these times, people may feel peace within their hearts, peace within their homes, peace within their own neighborhoods and communities, and seek peace that is a larger and a greater peace in the civic realm the spiritual realm, the political realm, for all people. And along with peace must come healing, healing of the bodies and the minds and the hearts that we have mentioned out loud, those that we hold in the light. But you know each of us and all of us, and you know where healing is needed. And so we ask for that healing. And then we ask to come back around to gratitude, to be reminded that there is always a reason to celebrate, to lift up our eyes to the hills, to the light, to each other, and to your presence with us always. We pray together now in the words that you first taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can unmute yourselves to join us. We'd like to hear your, your voices, please. I'm going to start us again. Our Father, who art in heaven, art in heaven. <clears throat> hallowed, be, hallowed thy be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will thy be will done. done on earth, on earth as, it as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this Give day our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our forgive sins. Us as we As forgive those who sin against, against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, not temptation but deliver but us from evil. evil. For thine For is the kingdom, the, kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. And you can mute yourselves again. This is a lot of choreography going on to do these things. The, the people in the sanctuary are pretty happy because they're not getting lots of directions from me. At least I'm interpreting it as happiness. <laughs> and at this time, we're going to read scripture. And we've been studying... We've been studying the letters of Paul. And so today we are focusing on the shortest letter that Paul wrote to anyone, anywhere, and that is the letter to Philemon. 
And if you're on Zoom, you can see this on your screen, but I'm going to read it out loud for all of us. These are excerpts from that letter. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Afia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Former Healy was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is I am sending my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. <coughs> If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. One thing more, prepare a guest room to be for me because I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. My fellow prisoner sends greetings to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So ends the reading. Okay, and so we have this really interesting intersection of influences today. We are studying the letters of Paul, and Philemon is a particularly powerful letter in the, the context of Paul's arguments because it's been used historically both to justify slavery and to argue against slavery. Right? It's been lifted out of its own context and used by people to either oppress others or try to free them. And we also have this three-day weekend, which traditionally was called Columbus Day, but there's obviously this movement to continue to, to change that, to call it Indigenous Peoples Day, because one of the things that we're doing, doing both when we think about people whose ancestors were enslaved here in the U.S., and when we look at um, our history in relationship to Indigenous peoples is to begin to hear more of the narratives that have so long been hidden. And I want to bring alive for you just a little bit today some of our own traditional history and some of the things that we may not know about our own story and place that into the context of Paul's letter. I remind you again, you know, that Paul writing, he says he doesn't want to send Onesimus back. Onesimus in Paul's day was a slave that had probably either stolen something or at least run away. So he had committed a crime against his master and owner. And so Philemon, the person to whom the letter is addressed, is actually the person who owns Onesimus. And Paul's writing to Philemon and appealing to him to begin to think about Onesimus not just as a slave, not just as a piece of property, but as someone with his own volition, his own value, his own ability to contribute to the community. And Paul says how invaluable Onesimus is to him. And he calls him his heart. And it's considered that this may be a watershed moment for Paul, 
this may be a time when he begins to really write about the fullness of humanity and that some of the other texts that we then later quote that all shall be free in Christ, no longer Greek, nor Gentile, nor Jew, slave, nor free man, nor woman, that his relationship with Onesimus may have inspired some of that recognition and expression of the fullness of, of Onesimus humanity. And in restoring Onesimus to the household where Philemon was the founder of a church, co-founder with Paul of a little house church. He's asking a lot of that house church. He's asking them to bring Onesimus back in to reconcile with Onesimus who had transgressed against them. But, you know, I'm going to remind us again, too, of resistance narratives, right? We have counter narratives. Um, what would the slaves have thought? Did, were they committing a crime when they tried to leave their enslavement? Or were they fighting for the fullness of their own humanity? Would, would the indigenous peoples that sought to be recognized in so many different ways have considered that they were committing a crime or that they were asking to be recognized as people? Paul asks Philemon to recognize Onesimus as a whole human being. And today, that's a huge piece of what I want us to focus on as we then think about some of our own founding stories. So I learned an interesting fact this week as I was looking at the history of indigenous people and our connection with them. I, I learned a lot of things, but I want to share one particular narrative thread with you. And I'm going to begin by bringing us back to the doctrine of discovery. I think that's our first image this morning. I'm hoping so. Uh, there's the Magna Carta, which you know, part of our own democracy is founded on. And it talks about recognizing people and their rights, right? And so we're gonna trace how we as a nation think about people as human beings by the rights that we have not recognized and then we have begun to restore to them. And then we move to the doctrine of discovery and the doctrine of discovery was written by a pope in the 1400s to give people from Europe permission to go to other parts of the world. And if they discovered, if they came upon land, that it would be legally held by the nation or the people that discovered it, as opposed to the people that already were inhabitants there. Right? And for, as we think about indigenous people and Columbus Day and that fraught argument, this is an important thing to know, that the doctrine of discovery is part of our legal foundation. And it became the legal means through Europe and then later in our own US tradition to maintain ownership of land that we had not originally had claim to or inhabited. And it was even used as we spread westward. It was used as part of Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine. You know, it was a forebear to those things. And it has been used, the Doctrine of Discovery, as recently as 2005 in Supreme Court rulings to uphold the U.S. ownership of land. Okay, so it's it, from the 1400s into this century, the discovery, the doctrine of discovery is actually a legally binding document and precedent for us. So if we move forward through the, we have images for people in Zoom. Um, in the 1800s, it was used. And then if we move forward again, we'll see that in 2005, I'm showing them the case, the city of Sherrill versus the Oneida Nation in New York um, decision against the Oneida Nation. And our, and our beloved Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually wrote the majority opinion, which upheld that um, legally binding decision. And there's more complexity. None of these things are simple, so I want to acknowledge that too. But just to let us know, you know um, our, from then to now, um, this is an ongoing, very active question. So then we move forward and we think about the Continental Congress. And I'm showing a picture of the Continental Congress because 
One of the amazing things that I learned this week, and you're going to hear why it's part of our symbolism, is that there were delegates invited to the Continental Congress, and we can move forward in the image. Um, first of all, in our Declaration of Independence, which people from the Continental Congress helped to write, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're going to notice a few things. One is that it's men who are named in the Declaration of Independence, but that changes in the Constitution to persons. They change the language and take away gender. And I also want you to be aware that in many states, including New Hampshire, women could vote before this constitution was ratified. And that changed when our government was formed. In some states, women could vote, other people could vote who then lost the right to vote. And here we move to the next image and we actually begin to see images of Native Americans at the deliberations of the Continental Congress because delegates from the Iroquois Nation, which was a consortium, a confederacy of six nations, were invited to come and speak because they had already built and modeled a successful confederacy. And so here we have this, um, we go from doctrine of discovery, this legal precedent to be able to take land, seize land. And then we have people with whom we have not always had a peaceful relationship, but whose way of living, they, they went from being at war with each other as nations to finding a way to be at peace together by having a council. And they came and spoke to Continental Congress. And we'll move forward to the next image. And then we sort of promptly forgot that they were there, except in the writings of a few of our founding fathers. But the imagery of that time remembers what we have forgotten. So we're going to move forward in another image again. It's another image of the Iroquois seated at a table with the founding fathers. And then I want to give you the words in the next image. Actually, that's a wampum belt, and it shows the symbol of the Confederacy there. And there's an arrow there, and the arrow is going to be important to what we're going to share. Next image, then. Kenasatego's words. He, uh, as a representative of the Iroquois, he wrote to the Continental Congress and gave them advice about unity. Also asked them where were the women because the Iroquois also included women in their uh, councils and their governance. So they were wondering where the women were. So that's kind of funny. But after that greeting, the Continental Congress wrote back to the Iroquois nation, and these are the words that they said. Kanasatego's words sank deep into our hearts. The advice was good and it was kind. You said to one, and we said to one another, the six nations are a wise people and let us hearken to their counsel. They have frequently taken a single arrow and said, children, see how easily it is broken. And then they have tied 12 together with strong cords and our strongest men could not break them. See, they said, this is what the six nations mean. Divided, a single man may destroy you. United, you are a match for the whole world. And if you move to the next image, um, there was a, a commemorative dollar coin that was handed out, and it had a wampum belt wound around a bunch of arrows. 13 arrows, actually, in total. Well, they have five because it's their single nation. But those arrows then translate into, can you guys picture the Great Seal of the United States? We're going to move forward in an image, and you guys will be able to see it. We have the eagle with its wings spread, and it has two feet. And in the right foot, left if you're looking at the eagle, but it's right foot, it holds the olive branch, which traditionally has the 13 leaves and the 13 olives for the 13 colonies. And in its left foot, it holds a bundle of arrows, 13 arrows. Those 13 arrows in that imagery comes directly from the language that was shared between the Iroquois to the Continental Congress and the, ima the imagery of 
one arrow, like be, being alone, we, we can be broken. That when we bind ourselves together in this confederacy and we acknowledge our humanity and the importance of each voice and each one's contribution, we can't be broken. And they took that imagery and that bundle of 13 arrows and placed it into the foot of the eagle. And so our own constitution is based on some of the structure of the Iroquois Confederacy's work, as well as other places and documents. But even the symbol of our nation holds within it the memory and the story of the Iroquois and their contribution to our founding. I didn't know that until I began to explore why people want to push back against one story and make sure that we're hearing all the stories and that we don't vilify people who did amazing and important things in our past. Frederick Douglass, speaking on Independence Day, praised the founding fathers and the work that they had done, and yet he said, those rights don't apply to me. And we know that even with all that great idealism, population after population struggled to be recognized, to have the right to vote, to be counted even as a whole person. In the 13th Amendment, we formalized the freedom of slaves. But before that time, when the Constitution was written and we were trying to figure out our representation legally in the federal government, we can end the sharing of the um, images for the moment. Um, Native Americans weren't counted at all because they didn't pay tax, so they didn't have a vote and they weren't counted when we were numbering population to decide how many delegates a state would have. And slaves counted as three-fifths of a person because the slave owners paid tax on them. And even if they couldn't vote, they, they were um, worthy enough of having part of a delegate assigned to them. And so people were used because they, their bodies were taxed even though they themselves did not have the vote. And even though the Emancipation Proclamation made people into citizens, the right to vote was still unavailable to people for over another 100 years. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that many, you know, like our black brothers and sisters could more fully have their rights protected so that they could get to the polls and vote. Native Americans weren't considered citizens until 1924, and the last time that they were refused the right to vote was in 1962. So even after a federal act in the 20s, states were still denying them the right to vote until 40 years later. We know women worked on the right to know the right to vote. We know that the ADA Act and certain Supreme Court rulings have redefined who is human, who has a full voice and the right to full participation in our government. We know that in these times, that struggle continues and that we're being asked to hear different kinds of stories. I wanna offer you one more thing that the Iroquois brought to us. And that is that they opened and closed every council meeting with words of gratitude. The way that their council worked together and that these five and then six different nations were able to establish peace instead of war was to focus themselves always on gratitude when they opened and then when they closed their meetings of deliberation. And so I want to offer you the words of gratitude that were spoken in some of those council meetings. The great, great power came from up in the sky, and now it is functioning. The great power that we accepted when we reached consensus. So now our has become complete. Now, therefore, we shall give thanks. That is, we shall thank the creator of the earth that is, the one who has planted all the kinds of weeds and all the varieties of shrubs and all the kinds of trees. 
and springs, flowing water such as river and large bodies of water such as lakes, and the sun that keeps moving by day and by night the moon and where the sky is, the stars which no one is able to count. Moreover, the way it is on earth, the people who the one created and who will continue to live on earth. This then is the reason that we thank the one, the one with great power, the one who is the creator, for that which will now move forward, the good message and the power and the peace, the great law. May we be reminded of the symbol in the great seal that when we are bound together, we cannot be broken, that the head of the eagle is turned not towards the arrows, but towards the olive branch and towards peace. And that the way that people strive for peace is to include all the voices, those that were missing from the Continental Congress and from the council and have been missing so long in our own history and have been added one by one by one. Men who were not landowners, men who were black and of different colors, people that had come from different countries, women, Native Americans, so many different voices have been added and validated. But the way that we are able to accomplish this work, which is still always challenging, is to frame the work we do together with gratitude by saying thank you to the one that created all of us at the beginning and at the ending of every encounter and experience that we share. Paul sent his heart to Philemon, and he asked Philemon to see Onesimus as a human being, worthy of having a full share and a full voice in the community to which he belonged. In our day, let us continue to dream that every voice counts, every human being matters, and that we may fall short of that ideal. We do it again and again, we fall short, but we get up and we keep trying because we are bound together. And every story and all of these heritages make us better and make us more. Thanks be to God. Okay, friends. We're going to remind people that are out in Zoom. Um, you already got a really great reminder from Jeanette, but just that every week we ask if you're able to, you're not here with us, but if you have a little cup or a basket that you're putting a donation into, feel free to do that, or you can go to jxncc.org and make your offering. And um, if you received a letter from this church, please remember to answer it and help us with finishing out this year strong and also planning for who we will be next year in the world. Friends, now is that time in the service when we um, come to our closing, and we're going to, okay, now this is the hard part. If you're in Zoom, you get to sing. If you're here, you don't get to sing, so you can listen, but you have to be good and not sing here. Um, and so we're going to hear Bob Carper's voice. And Alan's playing pre-recorded, and it's going to play right now. 
and then we'll um, have Alan play us out with live music, but we're going to start with the benediction. So um, mute yourselves and sing along. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 